Recording um, in progress. Um, six people at the at the meeting, and part of it has to do with the fact that I think um, people are are on trips, and uh, also some people are kind of getting skittish about the Delta variant. So. Um, well, now, do you do a Zoom meeting or not? We did both. Um, so I had my laptop there and we had a, a camera going. And uh, since, um, since this was all controlled by the single computer going, uh, I could share my screen with everybody on Zoom while showing everybody with a uh, LCD projector. So that where that actually worked out pretty good. We've done two meetings like that. Um, so uh, and so there was. Uh, I turned the the laptop around, and uh, so when I was up there, I could see what was on the screen, and also, like in this case here, where the Zoom meeting, the people are there, and you know, so it's just. It, it worked out okay. Um, I think what would be needed is a um, wireless mic, you know, so that I could be heard better, you know, wherever I am in the in the room. But it it, it worked out okay. Um, at my synagogue, we're trying to do Zoom meetings and we're having a terrible time because I'm trying to put the audio through the PA system. So if anybody's in the sanctuary, they can hear everybody on Zoom. Um, and we've met that with limited ex, um, success. I think part of the problem is that the way Zoom works, you can't really set the levels reliably. So um, the last time the uh, guy did it, it was just big booming noise and he just turned it off and just went to a, uh, a laptop because they stopped meeting in person. So, uh, you know, uh, theoretically, you're supposed to be able to do that, connect your computer via Zoom through a PA system so you can do things in parallel. Um, I think in the future, we're going to try and just get a speaker connected to the laptop and just operate it that way. I guess there's um, there's like a feedback loop of sorts. Um, so um, yeah, typical stuff. Yeah, just got to work yeah, it out. Well, yeah, we'll work it out. In the meanwhile, the way they designed it, they designed it to work on a laptop or in a room where there's only one video source and one audio source. And so the, the, immediately when you put two audios on there, it just goes to, uh, it just falls apart. Um, mm. You get weirdness. As a matter of fact, um, when we first started out with uh, Zoom for my astronomy club here, my wife would be in the other room. Uh, and through closed doors, her audio was getting through to my laptops. So. Um, we had to stop that. So, you know, not everything's under your control because the software engineers being engineers make assumptions about how things should work and how things, the use cases. And so I think um, in, the, in the case of what I'm trying to do with the, like with the synagogue and with, with the meetings, it's a little outside of it, you know, at least in the meeting and in, in our club meetings, there's no audio system that it has to go through. So, uh, but we'll get, you know, we'll get it all figured out. Um, hey, Hank, how are you doing? Pretty good. Got back two days ago. It was a long drive. Wow. wow. What did, how'd you get there? What kind of driving were you doing and what vehicle? I think I did about uh, 8,000 miles on the in a Chevy Cruze, Chevy Cruze Eco. So hmm. it gets good mileage, but uh, yeah, 
you have to get gas at least once a day. Um, so, so I. So what I, was MPG on it? Uh, um, well, it depends on how, how fast you drive. Um, when I drive 70, it's like 42, 44 gallons on the freeway, I think. Uh, it's, it's a small engine with a, a turbocharger. Um, so it, it's the I Obama see. car. It's the Obama car, actually. So, huh. well, actually, I have a friend that uh, a couple of years uh, previously bought one of those cruise diesels, and he gets really good mileage with it. Yeah, it's a, yeah, they're, they're, it's a diesel. Right, right. Okay, so yeah, there's two differences. I mean, there's a regular Chevy Cruze and there's the Chevy Cruze Eco. So the regular Chevy Cruze gets like 36 miles a, a gallon or something, um, but the, the one that I have gets. 42. That's the official range. Uh, you want to hear you? You want to grow now? Um, my <clears> wife has. We've we've got this. Um, I guess it's a eight year old, uh, eight years old or six years old uh, Honda Accord V6 that on really long trips gets over 40 miles of the gallon. Good. Yeah. That's crazy. Must yeah. have a great overdrive. Are you driving really slow? No, no, not the way my wife goes. <laughs> wow. wow, it's a V6. That's amazing. Yeah, uh, well, well, those are good, but I don't want to buy Amer buy Japanese. I want to buy American. So yeah. yeah. Well, how much American? I have lost Mandy car? Mount, and it gives me all that work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. Uh, I, 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 I still get the, the Los Mandy, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, the email uh, server or whatever, you know, uh, the group. It used to be Yahoo, it's now it's IO. There's a lot of activity on there with the uh, Los Mandy. And groups IO, yeah, something like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, did you read the news that I sent? Don't think so. Okay, William Bell is. Uh, oh yeah. Yep. It's they're they're going to publish again through the uh, people who bring you Sky and Telescope. Is that American? Is, was it the Astronomers Society? Something? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I saw that on their site. Some for some reason I saw that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't normally go to these sites, uh, so I, I I belong to the AIP for Windows uh, group, and uh, Richard uh, made that an announcement. So what it, what what it means is uh, we're going to be able to afford to get books again, you know, instead of paying through the spot market, you know, no more. No more uh, three hundred dollar uh, books. They're going to be back to whatever the price was originally. I thought that that was uh, pretty cheesy on on some people's parts to try and. Uh, yep, and and it's not just Richard's books. It's all those other books, which is really important. And hopefully, they'll have the one on star testing and. I well, they're sponsoring your, your, your software too, right? There's something about your software? Yeah, well, the, the, the software is going to be, uh, Richard says uh, it's going to be continued to be free. You won't need a key for it. Um, the only thing that they uh, don't know for sure is if they're going to include the CD-ROM for free because you can just get it over the internet. Um, the only thing, the only advantage of having a CD-ROM is that it comes with all the example images, you know, which is quite a bit of downloading. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy about that. So if they have the entire catalog, which I hope, you know, it'll include Tessaru's book and uh, the uh, um, star testing and uh, the optical design and uh, a bunch of other books. And, and in addition, you know, you'll have the you know, 
did you see how they named the Will, Will Millman Bell, how they got the name there? Yes. Yeah, I thought use, that was cute. Okay, they, so this won't be $300. <laughs> hold, hold on, Mike. I, I have to stop sharing to see what you're talking about. Which, which okay. one are you talking about, Mike? Okay, hold a second. Let me just do a stop video and get rid of the virtual background. Okay, this one. You know, the springtime. Uh, on the internet, they they wanted uh, several hundred dollars for that. Eight hundred and fifty bucks is that the one? No, this was the one they wanted for eight oh nine. Okay. It seemed like there's a three volume set too somewhere where there's there's we wanted eight hundred and fifty bucks for each volume or something. Oh, it was just it was you know it was you know not since the day of PP, PPEs have uh, people, you know, gouged so much. So, uh, so Hank, uh, you, you had a big deal about going to Stellafane. I, I was hoping some other people would show up here by now. It's, it's, we're at the 732 right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Just maybe we'll hold on just a little bit and I'll show you a couple of things while we're waiting to see if anybody else shows up here. But sure. Wanna... Did you, take, you got pictures to show, Hank? Yes, I do, but it would be uh, better if, if there were a larger audience. Uh, we could do it yeah. next time. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Might have to wait till next time. Yeah. This, this is a what's called a hand planetarium. I don't know if you can see in there. Uh huh. And, and you just hold it up to a light, and uh, looking through that through that in, and it gives you a nice uh, view of the uh, of the sky. And of course, it's got a a dial around the outside that months and uh days i guess and so you can dial it into what should, should be up in the sky what if that's broken is that broken there yeah broken so the some part of the dial is broken on the outside missing part of december oh yeah oh i've got january february march april may june i'm missing july oh okay i'm missing july through uh october part of october so that's the outside You'd have to guess about that, but it was just really, it was really kind of cool. You look through it, it's, it's got this blue, blue, uh, the letters look blue in the sky and got the star pattern. So it's a really cute little, well, that's about four, less than five inches long, that thing. Hmm. I picked that up. There's a, the guy in town, I don't remember, he, we mentioned this last time, uh, from Douglas Telescopics. He, he's 92 and he passed away last November. And uh, his he name is Doug told. Bryson. Doug Bryson was his name. And his daughter, Carolyn Street, she's offering all this stuff to take home for free. At the, at, you know, it's mostly it's a bunch of junk uh, binoculars stuff and uh, a lot of little magnifiers. But it had some oddball things like this thing. And also, it had this Celestron. Uh, the gizmo here it's a c90 but it, it has like a it, the eyepieces that go in the center of it are um are uh are 0.965 eyepieces and you can see that 500 millimeter f 5.6 yeah I, and, I had a friend or two that had one of those back then you know some oxytoff of course yep uh huh. Pretty, pretty clean inside. But it's got now, some external you... external threads. I'm not sure what those threads on the outside that size. So because you can fit a nine point nine six five eyepiece down the center of it, I don't know what the outer threads are for. They show a catalog and they show some beautiful babes looking through the with their camera yeah. attached. Cool. And so, so you can thread straight into your DSLR. Yeah, somehow there's got to be some sort of adapter for that. I just look yeah. at the moon through it. It looked look pretty look pretty sharp. It's pretty nice. Huh. But kind of funny is it's just using the uh, eyepieces, a little 965 eyepieces, 25. Now, this guy had the place that's on uh, State Street um, um, in a small shop underneath a uh, hotel. It's, it sounds about right. I'm not really sure when he stopped his, his shop. Uh, had a bunch of eyepieces that, uh, let me share this with you. It's, uh, Jerry was commenting on the, uh, on these things. Let's see, which one is it here? I think this one here. 
And we see uh, down here, I was telling the eyepieces down here, it's actually, I, point, I said 0.925, but actually it's nine, 0.965, I believe is really correct. A unitron, seven millimeter and a six millimeter. Oh, Tim is coming in for some reason here. If I can get to it, admit, oh, admit all. More people are coming in here. Oh, okay. Got Dick and, and Tim for a little bit. Don't see Jerry this evening. Hey, Tim. Hey, Dick. Coming in there. Hi, guys. I can't stay hey. long, but I just had to come and, and see a little bit. Okay, good. We're just showing the uh, eyepieces that got from this uh, Doug Bryson, the uh, Douglas Telescopics passed Ooh, away. Okay. So a one, there's a one inch eyepiece is called Clave made in Paris, I guess. Six Those millimeter, 25 millimeter. Good. Yeah, so Jerry says the two claves are apostles and are real collector items. And uh, 1.25 Gallic and uh, Jagers, I don't recognize that one. Jerry didn't Jagers mention that is one. A major uh, importer of uh, optics. Uh, Koenig University, multi coated university, university fossil. Delkin, Barlow, Brandon, Ortho, no name, Mead, kind of Ortho. And then I had a, previously we had around here, Mead research grade Ortho as well, that uh, Doug, that Joe Doyle told, told us that a friend of his said, hey, I saw you advertising the scope and Craigslist uh, for 150 bucks. And one of the eyepieces you're showing is, is worth a hundred dollars. And so I took that off the deal, but, uh, it was kind of interesting that uh, some of these eyepieces are, are really collector's items. You got to be careful. You got to really look into them, I guess, to find out what they're worth. Well, the Vernon scope stuff is uh, considered very good. So, but but also the uh, orthoscopics uh, back then were made in Japan and had very good. Were were very good. I guess. The old orthoscopics only had about three to five elements. They had four elements, one triple and one single. Okay. Now, some of the magnifiers make sure that there's the regular magnifiers that may have one lens or two lenses, but there's also what they call triplet loops. Um, and those are very good they're they're um, actually considered uh, I wouldn't say fairly expensive but they're they're a higher grade they're uh, they have flat field and they were like about two to four times more expensive they're hmm. premium grade stuff so if it says triple loop on there then they're they, you know they're worth more I think I did get one loop from her that was just two lenses that you you fold in front of each other yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> but but the other one is is I, I bought a couple from uh, of all places RTMC you know from uh, um, various uh, vendors over the years and they're very good. As a matter of fact, um, I think Tesseru shows how to make a eyepiece on one. It's not a very wide field one, but it's um, it's they tend to have pretty good clarity because it's only one large lens with two surfaces for reflections. Not quite as oh. good as a, a tolls or a, uh, the, the young, other single element ones. Well, well let's, let's uh, see if Hank wants to do a presentation. It'll be recorded, Hank, so if anybody wants to see it, they can go to YouTube and <laughs> pick up your information. Sure. Yeah, so if you want yeah, to go. I'd be surprised if anybody besides us would be looking at it, but who knows? Right. You know, I, we mysterious. usually get, you know, anywhere from four to 20, maybe people that somehow look at it for five minutes and carry on. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's, it's there but, for the history. Yeah. Let me see if I can. Uh, okay. now, Tom, how do we find that recording? You said it was something like telework or. Well, you know, if you go to our webpage, sbau.org and you just click on the, the picture of us sitting there in the telescope workshop that'll take you to the yeah. youtube oh okay okay great oh look at cellophane yeah heavens declare the glory of god what's this 
please wear a mask. <laughs> but won't God protect me? <laughs> All right, so those who protect them. You've got the roll of the dice. <laughs> that looks like an oil well in the back there. Okay, so this uh, this was part of my trip. I uh, went to I did a cross country road trip over the past couple three weeks and uh, visited my son in uh, at MIT. Um, work was kind of slow here, so this was a good time because Stellafin was at the same time, so I combined that. Uh, it was fun. Um, anyway, let me just start with Stellafin here. Uh, we went on. Uh, uh, my son and I went to this place. We uh, you could camp on on the terrain itself, so we camped there for uh, three nights. It was from Thursday through uh, Sunday. Sunday mo was mostly Sunday morning, people packing up and so on. And Thursday was for the early arrivers. So we found a nice uh, spot right next to the telescope field. And uh, it's a nice terrain. So Stellafane is uh, it's a very old club. The, the, um, the telescope, STM, the Stellafane Telescope Maker, Springfield Telescope Makers. That, that's, that's what it means. That's the club name. Um, it's uh, this this building is probably old, more than 100 years old. It's also very small. If you go inside, it's very old and uh, beams and whatnot. And there's an upstairs, but the the the, the steps I, you have to pull them down from the ceiling, and it's all very hard. So, <laughs> and uh, it's probably the only kind of paint that was available in those days. I don't know how they got it, but anyway, it's pretty cool. What is what is that stuff on the front uh, mass there? I see the stellophane symbol, but above the, the stellophane uh, cutout, there's some sort of like, looks like a, a yoke or something for maybe cattle. Yeah, I, I don't know what that, the, that the horizontal thing, that black thing, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it, it does look like that. Yeah, I have no idea what it's used for. I didn't ask, <laughs> didn't notice it. Anyway, um, so where was I? Uh, yeah, so this, it, they they sometimes use this uh, still for for meetings, but not very often. And the the STM, uh, I believe they own that whole uh, piece of land, so that's probably why it's so old and why by this uh, continuity. So, uh, and it's a large area actually. So anyway, let's go on to the next one. This is um, close to what we were just looking at. I've got some other pictures where I see them both. This is a a weird kind of telescope. So here, off to the left. Uh, that's where you place the mirror, and here's, uh, I mean, the parabolic mirror, and here's a flat mirror that you can aim at the object, and it's got a hole in the center, so that's where the, light, the re return uh, light goes through. I think it's a hole in the center, or they may place it slightly off-center, I'm not quite sure, but uh, that's sort of how it works, and so you can aim the telescope, not by, by moving this uh, <clears throat> frame, but by just moving this... Uh, secondary mirror and it goes to the inside and that's where the uh, you can look at it this here is if i pronounce it right a spectroheliograph um, it collects light from the outside and it goes inside through eventually through a um, diffraction um, diffraction uh, grid and um, uh, grating and uh, it shows the sun in, in a particular spectrum. So if you, by turning the diffraction grating, you can actually uh, view at, look at the sun in different wavelengths, optical wavelengths. And the way that this, this is actually the, uh, the eyepiece that you have to look through. There's a rotating prism that's uh, actually, there's one here and there's one at the top. The light bundle comes in from the right through this blue uh, thing. And let me just show you the schema. So I think this one's better. So, so first the sunlight goes through these two flat mirrors. It directs it into onto this lens here. This is probably still on the outside. I'm not quite sure, but it goes then to the inside and um, through this slit. Forget about this prism for a second. So if you if you would normally project the sun, then the sun would project like a disc on this thing. So the slit basically selects one, one vertical uh, line of the sun. And then it goes to this uh, mirror, gets on the diffraction grating. And by turning the diffraction grating over a special angle, uh, what, you know, a color specific angle, it gets reflected. He goes back through another <clears throat> slit and then into the eyepiece. Now, if you rotate this uh, prism fast enough, and this thing was rotating at like, uh, I don't know, 
50 hertz or something and very fast. I mean, you could not see the uh, prism itself. It was rotating that fast. And by doing that, then uh, this um, uh, image of the sun uh, slides around the entire slit. So then, then you get the entire sun image in the eyepiece. I thought it was kind of clever. This, um, was, this was described in the original um, telescope making books by Inglis. Okay. But this actually, this diagram actually shows it much better the way that it works than in the uh, diagram. Okay, yeah, I thought it was pretty clever. So George Ellery Hill invented that. I'm not sure if that's the same Hill of the Hill Telescope, but who knows, it might be. Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, he, did a lot of, he did a lot of solar viewing. Okay, yeah, yeah. And this is what you see outside. So uh, I think we saw that already. Yes, yeah, the slides are not arranged in a particular order, so I'll just click through it. And if we've seen things twice, then I'll just click through them. So that's why you see both things on the hill. Well, so um, that's what it looks like. Yeah, what you mean? This that, that pink where the pink house is. I, I've never seen the surroundings around it, I've never seen that. This picture right, right. shows me a lot. Yeah, I have some, uh, they gave me some pictures from uh, when I bought a t shirt, it came with some pictures, and you see the old cellophane. And uh, yeah, the telescope viewing field has been at different places depending upon, you know, but anyway, I'll just go on here. Um, so yeah, some people walking around. So this is uh, eventually uh, the uh, DIY competitors are all on, going to be on this field. Um, and we'll see that later on. This was um, a lot of work, I think. It's basically a simple Dobsonian, but uh, very nicely done. It's not even such a large mirror, I believe. So, but uh, yeah, that's all machined uh, and in a very artistic way. A refractor, I'm not quite sure what the DIY aspect of that one was. And there's several newts, obviously do it yourself. Um, here's a daub and another Newtonian. Uh, yeah, different views, same thing. Now, uh, one well, time that that, that that turret held two telescopes. On the other side, they held held a Cassegrain that counterbalanced it, and they took it off eventually. That's called the turret telescope. Are you talking about this? Uh, tel yes. Yeah, I think it's called the turret telescope. Yep. And the the reason why they could build it that way is because uh, at the time um, there was a lot of machinists that worked. Uh, on cannons and stuff like that in the local armory. Oh, okay. So they had yeah, you know what, uh, speaking of machinists, um, one of the things that we did on Sundays, uh, we went to the American Precision Museum, if you've ever heard of it. It's in Windsor. It's not far from uh, Springfield. So this is in Springfield, Vermont, by the way. It's about 10 miles from Springfield. And that's actually where the, uh, well, they, they called it Precision Valley. So there were like uh, three engineers that were basically starting with uh, automated gun manufacturing. And that, that they, they went on to other things and so on. And that became, you know, the center of uh, automation for in the, what was it? Uh, I think uh, 18th century or so. You ever uh, heard of the Springfield rifle? No. Oh. That's where this came from. Okay, yeah. I, I can show pictures of that as well, but let's go on for, for with this first, because it was kind of interesting. Um, this is actually not a DIY. This is a M NMT, this new moon telescopes. Uh, this is at the telescope field. So yeah, it's going back and forth. This is also at the telescope field. This is the weirdest, weirdest equatorial mount I've ever seen. Completely impractical because that tube is is has you know is moving over such a wide range that you will never be able to put your eye um, in front of the eye, eyepiece without having a ladder and moving it all over the place. Uh, a, a completely useless design, but well, it's it's kind of funny to look at. <laughs> wow. Um, this is a nice one, pretty artsy, nicely done. Um, and this is uh, the telescope field. So we were camped sort of right behind where I'm standing here. And that building in the distance, they also have a special, I think they have two telescopes in there. And one of them is a spectrograph, if I'm not mistaken, but I didn't spend much time there. And it was pretty crowded over there, especially, um, yeah, on Saturday night. And these guys are pretty damn serious. I mean, normally when you go to a star party, they they offer you like, okay, do you want to see you or something like that? But not here. They were so intense. It was kind of uh, 
I don't know if it was because people got mad because uh, you know cars were driving around and there were some that were just having their high beams straight into the telescope field and made people Ooh. mad. One of them, one of them actually threw an object uh, at the windshield of the of the car, and uh, so there was almost a fight oh, breaking no. out. So yeah, I mean th there are some idiots out there. You know, you, you wouldn't believe it. They just leave the high beam on and straight into the telescope field, and for a long time, and nothing works. It's like yeah. Anyway, so a bunch of uh, obsession telescopes, and this is nice portable uh, uh, Dobsonian. Wow. Well, well nice that's a bright colors. <laughs> yeah. This is this one, I believe this one won a prize. I can't that's recall exactly this one. Yeah, it's nice. This is a, a binoscope. I saw this guy at the RTMC uh, a long time ago, and he's pretty good. He all he also won a prize. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty simple design. The only disadvantage is that you know the the eyepiece, the, the bino, you know, you, you see two eyepiece stick, eyepieces sticking out here. Um they are always at the same angle. So if you have to rotate it, well, I guess it's alt out, so it's probably okay. Yeah. It works pretty well, I think. And this was for collimation. The guy, all these little things here, those are little uh, uh, pinholes that help you collimate the telescope. I'm not sure if this project was quite finished. It, I think it was described as unfinished, but uh, anyway. Um, Another <clears throat> Newtonian, I guess. I'm not quite sure what the deal is with this thing. Uh, more newts. And you look at all the counterweights. That's kind of, oh, wow. Boy, they did a lot of woodworking. That's what yeah. I was going to say. Pretty. Yeah. Uh, and what the deal with this quest star was, I'm not quite sure either. I can't recall everything that it said. I mean, it seems like a regular Newtonian again. Another Newtonian, very minimal. That's kind of Whoa. Cool. <laughs> totally minimal. <laughs> Dang. That's about yeah. as minimal as it gets, I think. I know. But yeah. This is where the headlights might hurt you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. By the way, if I go back to the one of those other telescopes, I recall one detail that was kind of interesting. Um, mm. This guy here. So he, this, this uh, secondary mirror was suspended with uh, uh, cables, uh, very tightly uh, wound cables, <laughs> you know, threaded. Um, so I, I think Whoa. there are six cables that are going through there. I don't know if these were piano strings or something like that, but wow. was, if you felt the tension on the cable, it was extremely tight. But I wonder what the spikes would look like on a picture. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so where were we? So, so Hank, Hank, were you able to look through these telescopes at nighttime? Uh, there's, I think I only looked through one. I didn't look, like I said, these people were pretty intense and uh, I was playing around with my own uh, barn door drive. What I brought to the uh, uh, cellophane was my, my binoculars, my 20 times 80 with the tilt all uh, uh, mount and a portable 50 millimeter telescope. It's, <laughs> it's uh, the, uh, what's it called? It's from, it's from Teleview. It's called the, uh, 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 the Rascal, the Rascal telescope. Once in a while they sell those. It's pretty sharp, but anyway, it's just, just not much more than a viewfinder really. <laughs> and a, a barn door drive that I could put my DSLR on. Unfortunately with the barn door drive, I, I forgot to bring my remote timer. So I was limited to 30 seconds which means that you might as well not have a barn door drive. But anyway, <laughs> I brought it with me, so I had something to show. So the people, they just wanted to look through their own scope. They didn't want to share the view with anyone. Is that what they yeah, view? I, I, well, I think if you get to the, if you're up on the telescope, I mean, all these people seem to know each other. It's like, uh, oh, okay. And so, and so it's kind of, they're, they're busy with each other and it's kind of difficult to, to interject yourself. And it was okay. I mean, yeah. Uh, the weather was not all that great. I mean, the weather was actually, so the, on um, Thursday night and Friday night, uh, it was mostly good weather. Um, once in a while, there were some clouds, but they went away later on. Uh, on Saturday night, it was totally over overcast, but uh, at least we had two nights out of three, which was good. Uh, but the skies were not superb. I mean, it was a lot of moisture in the air. In fact, on Tuesday, it had, it had been raining cats and dogs, and they had to set up all the tents in, <laughs> in that rain. So. Um, yeah, you can never know, you never know what the weather is like over there. So, all right. So here's a why why the Hank what why the disc on the front of that last scope you had there? 
I don't understand why he had a disc there. Is that a counterweight? No. Can't you know, be. I just oftentimes I just walked by and took pictures. I I, I honestly don't know what. Uh, well, that that's the that cap for be. the telescope. That that's for putting on the. Oh, 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 oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're yes. right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yep. Idea. Yep. <clears throat> um. Hmm. Another minimal dab. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me of one of those Hubble telescopes. I mean, the, the framing is just like the Hubble Dobsonians. I don't know if you know them. They're from China, 14 inch. It looks like about the right size. This year was- Gary Elbers was doing a lot of stuff like that. Uh, yeah, this was a restored telescope and it also won a prize. So there's somebody, it was an old telescope and was completely pretty. restored and made, made pretty. <clears throat> I've got some more pictures of that one later on. Um, yeah. Now this, this one is actually interesting. So it looks kind of, Weird. It's like a, it's one of these one armed bandits, but this was um, a 3D printed mount, but not oh. the whole thing was printed. It was I, the, the printing was very flimsy, I think, but the, he, the guy needed to just print the, the surroundings, the blue stuff that you see that's all made from uh, plastic, but it was filled in with, with concrete. So it was actually very strong. <laughs> and Whoa. he did, he did exper experiment with various kinds of concrete and uh, tested the strength and so on. He wants to start a company selling this. The guy was from um, Plane Wave. He had worked with Plane Wave and he almost got a job there or so, but uh, then COVID happened and it didn't go through. And this guy was a physics PhD. <clears throat> and um, the interesting thing about this is that he wants to use uh, a, an actual flush direct, uh, uh, sorry, actual flux direct drive. I don't know if you know that term. Yeah, it was new to me at the time, but I, I think um, Jerry showed us their plane way was making style like this, the direct drive at 20 some thousand yeah. dollars for big ones. And so right, a, right. this looks very similar. The, actually, the one that you see on the website is uh, $9,000. It's not even that expensive, but it's not the same kind of direct drive that this guy wants. So in China, they started working on these uh, um, motors that uh, or electric cars that have one motor per wheel. And they do that with the uh, actual flux drive. So it's a, a motor that the Chinese government wanted. And uh, that's the one that he uh, wants to use for this. I'm not sure if that's the one that's in there now, but that's an actual flux drive. If you have a regular uh, motor, then uh, the, the coils are wound in the radial direction, but these are wound just the opposite 90 degrees turn. So they're actually in the uh, parallel to the rotation axis of the uh, rotor. And uh, that apparently is the trick to, to get a huge momentum, huge, huge torque, and also very good precision. So um, I believe the precision is mostly provided by the encoders. So that's the expensive part of it. But uh, yeah, I was, I was kind of interested. And, and also, but by the way, this thing uses a lot of power. It's like 300 watt or something like that. Right? So mm -hmm. it's not, if you want to use it outside with a battery, then the battery is going to be empty pretty quick. Mm. That it's, uh, you know, for, for a little bit, I was fantasizing about putting one of those on my Los Mandy, but you know, with 300 watt, that's a little bit more than what I want. <laughs> why is there anyway, so much wattage required for a telescope like that? Why, why the high wattage? You think there be, there's no gearing involved? It's all. But the concrete's one reason. Yeah, but also the, no. If, if you if you look at actual flux uh, motors uh, on um, you know online. There's not a whole lot of them around, but you'll see those those uh, you know wattages around. So it's like 100 to 300 watts. There are also smaller ones, but uh, yeah, I think you're looking at uh, at a lot of uh, power consumption, at least a whole lot more than just uh, what you can run off a of battery. So it was an interesting project, although it didn't look like much, but uh, yeah, and it moved very smoothly. I can tell you that. This here is a radio telescope. Oh, wow. if you look at this, then you'll see there's a little uh, pin sticking out of copper uh, pin. And I think that's the antenna. So this guy was uh, looking at the Milky Way. He was doing, he was uh, uh, looking at the rotational speed of the Milky Way, which is, you know, an indication for dark matter. And he had a, a chart where he estimated it in various directions. And it was kind of cool. <laughs> now, did he leave that just in a fixed location and then just let the precessional motion uh, show what the heck the object was? Or how did he do that? Did he actually move this thing in track or what? Yeah, those are, those are all good questions. I didn't talk go, with him. I didn't ask. Um, go back to the he, previous he, picture. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. That looks like a drift setup. Okay. So he's just letting it drift. So you, you, you keep it, the antenna in a fixed location and you let the processional motion, uh, that's what you use to figure out what you're looking at, you know, wow. and make a picture of it, make an image of it. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's not really an image. I think he just selected a number of points in the night sky and he yeah. had a graph that shows, okay, this is the rotational velocity of yeah. various parts of the Milky Way. I mean, yeah. He wasn't looking at individual stars or, or you know, whatever. <laughs> He was probably looking at an RF spectral line, like a hydrogen or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Here's the foldable Dobsonian. This here, the special part here is just the eyepiece. He's, he, this guy made a 3D printed some, some device that lets you put three eyepieces on there and you kind of just click, 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 rotate. It's kind of uh -huh. nice to do. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah. So for, you know, if you do some outreach, it might be practical. And this is a close up of it. Uh, oh boy, so, that's pretty. Yeah. I wonder if that's the old, um, oh, who did the, uh, Alvin Clark? I wonder if it's an Alvin Clark scope. There were, a lot of those showed up in some of these, like up at, um, um, up at RTMC. Yeah, There's guys that they collect those things that are Alvin Clark scopes. And I, I talked to a guy up there that um, he worked it for the university back east, and then he got fired from there and went to another university. And he had a Alvin Clark scope, went back to the old university that fired him, and he traded his Clark scope for another one they had that was worth more. Anyway, they 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 do this this to them all. They fix them all up. But uh, I I just wonder. It, it reminds me of that, but I, it just doesn't, it's too shiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It would have been nice to see the before and after, you know, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, here's another dub. Yeah, those yeah, are I interesting. Think. There's yeah. that guy that machined everything. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Same one, yeah. I wonder if that guy, I wonder if that guy in that scope, that's the one that you showed earlier. And I wonder if he didn't make that refractor or is it the mount? This one here? Yeah. Hmm. Well. Yeah. And where did you see it before? I think early on in the slideshow that this one was showing and, and Hank said he didn't know exactly what the deal was with it. And, yeah. yeah, I don't know, know what the special part of it. I, I just walked around and, and only talked to, to a few, but uh, yeah, not to everyone. You know, because a few guys make they make their own refractors, and the reason I'm saying that is because it's a fairly uh, it looks like about a three inch diameter and a longer tube. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm guessing maybe he made that. Yeah, possible. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I also I mean I don't know if that's interesting, but I do have the you know. Uh, American Precision Museum. Let's just quickly. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to leave you guys. I want to see. I'm going to go to the recording and see this because uh, this is neat. Thank yeah, you, Hank. Thank, thank, thank you right. so much for sharing. You're welcome. So that's okay. the American Precision Museum. Uh, just said pause. Since we're you know telescope makers, maybe this is somewhat somewhat <laughs> slightly related. So it's a old building and. This is the beginning of Precision Valley in Windsor. It's only the bottom floor. There's my son with a mask on. And they had all these lathes. And they, they got the power from the river. So you see that belt behind there and uh, all these uh, you know, uh, gears on, on the uh, beam here. So that's how they powered all their machines to get going. And uh, what we were talking about, those guns. Uh, here's a, a, a gun. Uh, <laughs> Uh, gun stock. Let me see. Gun stock. Yeah. Gun stock. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Gun stock. Yeah. Yeah. And, various, yeah. and there was the one where they actually replicated. Um, yeah, here. So this is where they actually, the special thing about this uh, machinery was that you could finally, uh, you know, accurately replicate parts. 
And that was never possible with all the uh, handmade guns prior. So you could actually take guns apart and exchange parts and put it back together again, and it would work. And it was impossible with the, with the older uh, type of guns because they were all manual made. So was it Eli Whitney uh, have something to do with these uh, people? I can't remember. He, uh, he he was the inventor of the cotton gin, but uh, he I think he also was yeah. with these gun makers. I'm just clicking through this. It, 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 there's no end to it. I mean, they have all kinds of uh, measurement instruments. Also, an instrument to measure the speed <clears> of <throat> that kind of stuff. Sextants, sewing machines, mills, lathes, uh, precision instruments here. So it's it was pretty interesting. So if you ever go in that direction, you should probably stop here. These are the three engineers that started it. This was so, a machine for vertical parts, for vertical, uh, no, a vertical lathe, basically. So Hank, where did you set up your tent? Oh, um, that was, uh, I don't have a picture of that actually, um, but it was right be behind the telescope field. So. Um, is it a state park or just private property that Stella Fane owns? Yeah, so I think the, the whole area is probably, you know, a couple acres large. And no, not a couple acres, more than that, maybe 10 acres or something like that. And there are various parts where people can camp. So uh, when we came driving in, we just picked a, um, let me just uh, unshare this here. Stop sharing. We just... Uh, you know, uh, saw a lawn and there was a space and we picked that. But later on the next day, we found out that the, around the terrain, there's also a more wooded area. So we were in the, in the sunshine. So in, in the daytime, it got pretty hot. Um, luckily, in the daytime, we do, usually weren't there. On Friday, we went, uh, we did a hike of Mount Escutney, which is a good hike, actually. And uh, so only Saturday, we spent on the terrain, pretty much. We went to some talks and there were some interesting talks. There was a talk about the Hubble telescope and one about uh, light pollution. And the guy with that uh, blue one arm bandit gave a talk as well. And uh, there was one about um, PMTs, photomultipliers, which is kind of interesting because we use them at, uh, at work as well. Uh, so it was kind of interesting to hear how to tune those things to get the best performance. Here, here's a list of the Stellophane competitors. So if you want to look up those scopes, like that number 24 was a four inch refractor. Ah. First place, optical master class. Oh, that's 15, huh? That's, yeah. Yeah, so they have so. different, different uh, categories. They have the mechanical category and also the optical category. So they actually test your, uh, your you know, the quality of your lenses that you've made or the mirrors. <clears throat> So did they, did you enter your, did you enter your uh, equatorial mount in there at all or? No, 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 no. My uh, little barn door drive, that, that's the only do it yourself thing that I brought, no. <laughs> there was a guy, uh, yeah, we, we were actually camped right next to a guy who had a beautiful uh, binoscope that was made of uh, two six inch Newtonians. <laughs> and he did it in a very clever way. So, because if you have, you know, two, if, if these were, basically two loose Newtonians. And in order to collimate it and to be able to align it also with the pupillary distance and so on, you have to be so clever. And he did pretty pretty well. Is this yeah. the one right here? No, no, he's not here because he, I think he he probably, he's had the telescope for quite a while. So he must have submitted that years ago. Uh, uh. And you can only do it once for... Well, here, here is that guy with the three eyepieces. He got a special category first place. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Well, here's the first scope, 17 and a half inch first scope. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a, big, that's a big one. And here's a six inch first scope. But you got a first pot. What? First place. Yeah. Well, yeah, the 17 and a half inch was just mechanical, right? If that was the it first was a scope. dob. Yeah. 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 Just a big dob. Where right. You go? Yeah, right here. Mechanical, yeah, just a, just an entry as a first scope. Mm -hmm. uh, but your binocular one, he, mechanical design, first place. What else we got here? 
there's your pretty minimal, one of the minimal Dobbs first place optical, mechanical uh -huh. design, honorable mention. Oh, antique restoration first place you know, that, for that right. brass coat. And oh, that wooden one, that hexagonal one, got a first. It was a first scope by by this girl. Mm -hmm. uh, Fourteen point seven inch. Some good design there. Evidently, in an innovative collimation truss system. That, that name over there, <clears throat> Alexander Barakin, right right below that one. That's actually some a name that. I emailed with uh, on um, the OnStep forum. So I didn't know that he was there. Now that I see that name, I wish I could have talked to him because he helped me out one time getting Mount to uh, lower and, half, uh, half Oh, yeah, center. look at Mount, Mount Controller. controller. An imaging computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Let's see. Shoot. No more. They can't, don't see how many pictures next to some of these. Can't tell what they were. Huh. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. Learn something. So huh. like this, uh, it's under you know if you go to the main page for Stellafane and and a couple pages in, click on convention and twenty twenty one convention has right. all that information. Yeah, cool. The keynote presentation was actually kind of uh, odd. It was um, it was a presentation about uh, what was it about again? Let me see. Um, it was about. Uh, Solar. Oh, it was Beetlejuice. Yeah, Beetlejuice. But um, the level at which the presentation was given was like as if it was taught to just elementary school children or something like that. So it, it was kind of, I don't know, it was an odd presentation. And uh, the way things were described, she was telling that, uh, you know, the light uh, that uh, Beetlejuice uh, produced changed into dust or something like that, which is just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> I saw some people get up and leave. So that was not, not a success. <laughs> it looks, looks like we have hazy skies in our area from smoke, huh? I saw the haze. It started at Yellowstone and it lasted all the way to Santa Barbara on the way back. So, so this is a, the map I have on my on the sbau.org webpage. You can click on this fireairnow.gov map and um so oops it's already maxed up i guess so mm -hmm. should be a way of zooming in here yeah i was driving past the grand tetons and they you, should, you sort of drive around it right and so the mountains are at a distance and they were very hazy unfortunately i took some pictures but uh, they don't look good good is the grand tetons is that in wyoming mm -hmm. yeah it's right, right south of yellowstone okay up there so you you went across I eighty? Uh no, I ninety actually. I uh, on the way to okay. Cambridge, I first went through um, Escalante. So you take Cedar City in uh, Utah and go to Cedar Breaks, then Escalante and Capitol Reef. From there mm -hmm. on to Durango in Colorado. The, the, so five fifty north is called the million dollar uh, highway. It's beautiful there. It's just like Switzerland, very worthwhile. And then on to uh, uh, Kansas and Missouri and down to Knoxville and Tennessee because I wanted to see sm the Smoky Mountains and also <laughs> Boone Grove. So when Daniel Boone had his fort, I wanted to see that because there was a nice documentary on CNN that I uh, thought was interesting. Uh -huh. So I found that and also Richmond was there, the, the Battle of uh, Richmond in uh, uh, Kentucky. Uh -huh. And um, then I went on to Cambridge uh, through the Shenandoah Valley. And on the way back, I went uh, through the Great Lakes and I all of a sudden, I saw Niagara Falls. Okay, oh yeah, I gotta stop here. So I did the boat ride of Niagara Falls, and then on through Chicago, which was a living hell, and uh, <laughs> then uh, uh, what is it? Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, North Dakota, North Montana, Dakota. down to Yellowstone, yeah, uh, Wyoming. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I didn't want it to be too close. So I wanted to see the southern part first, and then on the way back from north. It was fun. It was a lot of driving, though. I mean, the Yellowstone day, I, start, I started driving at 7 o'clock because I wanted to see Yellowstone as well, right? So the game was kind of slow. And then I went, ended up in Salt Lake City. I couldn't find a motel. It's just like hell there. It's like one big metropolis, and they charge uh, you know, business prices 
So I went on and after two hours and at 10 p.m. that was finally when it stopped. So <laughs> it was a long day. Oh, from, from Santa Barbara to uh, Salt Lake City area? No, from, from uh, Cody. Uh, Cody is east of Yellowstone. That's why I had my motel. And then through Yellowstone, Grand Tetons, Jackson Hole, and then through some very desolate road to Salt Lake City. So I have one of these um, purple air air pollution monitors in my house. And you can click on up here in Santa Barbara. <clears throat> It's probably about this one right here. It says it's good, even though we're under this. Uh, so it's not, I guess it's not ground level pollution. It's up in the sky, huh? Uh, what does it look like? What kind of device is it? Yeah, just a little, uh, let me see if I can show you what it looks like. Purple, purpleair.com, a couple hundred bucks. It's this thing. Huh. I actually got the SD card if I wanted to look at it. Um, so just that, I hung it under the eaves of my house in the backyard. And uh, it's got a couple channels. So it's got two channels on it to look at the air. I guess it's got a light, a beam of light going through somewhere. Mm -hmm. Real time, it's got all sorts of different uh particulate matter concentrations that it looks at that gives data for. So specs. And it just so uses a kind of a USB power kind of thing, uh -huh. I think. Yeah, five volt DC. Oh, uh -huh. output. Well, I get a transformer to bring it down to five volts to it. Is that a citizen science project of some sort? Yeah, in a sense it is, yeah. So, but, you know, people are picking these up and then they've, they've made these maps. Uh, Purple Air has their own map that the fire, that the government takes some of these sensors from. Purple Air doesn't show you uh, the, uh, what do you call it? Does not show you, well, maybe I can do this. Doesn't show you the smoke like that other one does. So, See all the ones in Santa Barbara. Well, some of these are air pollution control district ones. There's my house right here at the West Goleta. Mm. And then it shows you uh, the in the now and within the last week, the averages over different time periods, and then gives you a chart that you can kind of zoom in and out on. So when, when my neighbor does some cookout, you know, that peaks up there. And, <laughs> and when I when I do it, it's terrible. I I, I have a a Traeger burner too, and boy, a lot of smoke comes out of that for a few minutes. So anyway, it's it's kind of neat, yeah. For 250 bucks, you can be part of this network of people are in air pollution control districts, showing what's going on in your neighborhood for air air quality. It's a lot of red up there in Northern California, Dixie Fire. Mm -hmm. Paso looks okay. Mm -hmm. It's not too bad out there right now. It's been kind of smoky though. It's, so. it's just that just overall, the the higher levels get have the pollution up there. Yeah, when I came back on Sunday night, the the sun was blood red. Yeah. Mm. And the sunset. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got back at around eight o'clock or so, and the sun was almost going under. Interesting. Yeah. Um. Speaking about Springfield, if I could share the screen. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is from Richard Berry. Uh, the Heartless, the Heart Heartless House in Springfield is for sale. 41 beds, 41 baths, 9,000 square feet, $750,000. <laughs> you, you know, oh, that's 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 Nightmare to take care of that. I've been looking at Vermont. It, 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 the whole Springfield area is gorgeous. It's just beautiful out there. Yeah. And they're building homes there on two acre parcels. Um, you know, it's in the woods. Uh, it's just fantastic. I was thinking, you know, if I'd have to move somewhere else, especially if you want to go to a place where there's, you know, moisture, 
then there's not much on, on the west coast. I mean, there's a narrow strip along the coast in Oregon and Washington, but there's a lot more green and, and moisture in, on the east coast. So Vermont is a beautiful area. Uh, of course, it's, it gets very cold in the winter time, and you get a lot of snow. A lot of rain. Yeah, a lot of rain too. But yeah. So is anybody taking any photos with their telescopes recently, or Dick, have you done any more? No, that's about it. I'm, I'm getting I'm getting ready for this next. Uh, cycle coming up uh, and I'm going to use the 24 millimeter lens again and reshoot the uh, I'll probably use uh, Saturn Cygni as the center that's one thing that I'm going to do and then I'm going to uh, probably shoot that C214 area there's another uh, NGC object that's next to that and I'm going to try the same thing that I did with the North American Nebula with the NP127 IS and do a three panel on that one as well. That's it, that's the future. So the C, C214, is that a Caldwell object? It's a uh, Cedar Ball, Cedar Ball 214. Uh, since C, I think it's called C, C, Cedar Ball, but uh, so that's what it is. Uh, it's the location of the object is, uh, let me see if I can, I can show you a picture of it, but basically what you're talking about is Cassiopeia, it's above Cassiopeia, and I think you're probably at about the zero hour RA wise, so you're up near, near the North Star region, probably maybe about 20 degrees below the North Star. So in deck, so you're 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 up there a ways. It's a fairly large object. Um, uh, let me see if I can get it here. Um, I'm trying to think of where I would have that. Never um, heard that name before. Yeah, it's um, it's not one of your more famous ones, um, but it's it's uh, yeah. I'm gonna have to go to the file server to get it because it's. I had to, you know, like I was telling you guys, I had to put a lot of the stuff over there because um, the, um, here we go. Oh, wait a minute, that's a project file. We could probably do it this way here. Uh, let me see here, documents. Okay, writings. Astro. Yeah, here we go. Okay, let's do it this way here. Uh, Cedar Ball 214. I get to the meeting here. Here we are. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. That's part of the object right there. So this is the lower part of the we're, looking, we're, just, we're just looking at your file uh, explorer. Yeah, that's seed two, that's seed two fourteen, right there. So that's that's basically the lower part of two pieces. There's an NGC portion, and then there's that portion too as well. Dick, Dick, we didn't we didn't see, we, we didn't see the picture. We just saw the you file didn't? explorer. Okay. At least I did. Okay, so it. it's not working that way. So what I got to do then is I got to go over here. When you click on the share, share screen. Yeah, share this guy right here instead of the one that I shared. So that's C214 right there. Okay. Mm. And that, that is the brighter probably of the two. And let me see if I can find them. I'm trying to think of the other one. That Did you is, take that, or is that uh, the? In, in yeah, the, that's uh, that. That I took with the ten inch. Uh, that's okay. a one thousand mil at one thousand millimeters right there. So let me see if I can find. There's another one. That, so Dick, uh, Dick, how do you how do you spell cedar cedar ball? Just like it sounds. Uh, cedar ball. I think that's it. Let me see if I can find on uh, the web what that seed. Cedar ball, cedar ball. Let's 
Cedar Blood. Maybe that's it. Yeah, Cedar C Cedar Blood. C E D E R B L A D. Cedar Blood. That's the I guess that's how you pronounce it. I'm not really sure about the pronunciation of that thing right there, but that, that's what I would say that it is. Now let me see if I can find the other one. There's one that shows both of those objects. Um and uh gosh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of what I called it is the problem because I got C214. And uh, I, I, I think it was an NGC number is the other object, but I don't, I don't, I can't quite make out. Now, let me see if I can get you another way we can look so at it. It says NGC 7822 is the same. Yeah, that's it. That's the other guy that's there. Let me Peter see if Black, I can get, 14. let me see. Uh, I'm going to say it's going to be Shedder, Shedder, uh, Shedder 24 millimeter annotated. Let me see if that's it. Yeah, there it is right there. Okay, now this is, let me see if I can get you over here. Share that guy. Uh, there it is right there. Okay, so you can see there's Cepheus. Okay, there's Cassiopeia right here. And, and this is it right here. It's kind of a crappy, this is a pretty crappy rendition of the area. Um, uh, because it doesn't use the method that I use now, the stars are, are not nearly as distinct. They're, they're, so uh, I'm going to be redoing a lot of this stuff. But you can see here's heart and soul over here, double clusters. Uh, and then this object right here, this is Cedar Ball 214 is here. And then the NGC 7822 is on top of that. So, and I, it seemed to me that I had. Um, I, I, well, I know I do. I have, I have a, both of those guys uh, somewhere with it that I took with the red cat. And uh, so, but I can't remember exactly what I called the dog on thing is the only problem. So anyway, but that both of those guys are on uh, in that object range right there that I'm trying to get. And what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to keep it constant in RA and I'm going to rotate the camera 90 degrees over let's say what I did when I did the North American and so I'm going to be I'm going to be moving I'm going to have the long axis of the sensor on the RA axis and the short axis will be deck and I'll move it up and down that way because if you look at the objects they're stacked one on top of the other you've got C, C214 and then you've got NGC 7822 whatever it is on top of that. So I'm just gonna run it up and down a deck and, and do a three plate a mosaic of that right there. Like, just like what I did with, with the North American, except the camera's gonna be rotated 90 degrees. So I get the sensor the right way. That's what I'm trying, I'm planning on doing. Uh, and so that uh, we'll see how that works out. You know, what I don't like about what I did on the North American, is they didn't uh, spend enough time at the very beginning in the merged mosaic. You've got to kind of take these masks that show where the panels are and go down those edges and see if there are any artifacts. Um, and that's, that's kind of what, uh, you know, I get so excited. And it, I looked at it and it looked like everything was fine. Well, then you find out later on, you know, there's a few things that are wrong with it. Uh, it's not bad, but uh, I think with a little bit more time, next time I'll spend a little time with it when I, before I do the merge mosaic and, and make sure that everything's right after that. Hey, hey, once Dick, you start that. Did, 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 did you, you see, see that the, Do you see this web page here? It's, the, the, the girl took uh, 63 hours to put together. Yeah, oh my. <laughs> with a mix, now, with a what mix. is that we're looking at? The mix that, that's, that's, Takahashi. <laughs> it's it's the NGC 7822. Oh, the uh, top part. The top guy. Yeah. Oh, two panes. Two two panels, yeah. Panel so, one and panel two, a two panel mosaic. So 1800 seconds, that's 30 minutes, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. And she did it in, in three different, uh, two, three filters, hydrogen alpha, oxygen, and sulfur. So those are, that even takes longer, see, because you have to shoot each of those separately with the filter. And Mike, it looks like it says it's got a MISO 200 mount. Is that what you have? Yep. And a Takahashi FSQ85. What's an FSQ? It's probably about uh, four or 500 millimeters. Well, 85, not 85 millimeter? Well, that's right. the size of the objective, probably. Yeah, right. Not the so, focal length. Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And what's all these? What's this black and white? What's hydrogen alpha only? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's now. mostly it's mostly hydrogen alpha for the most part. Wonder so. what she's trying to show here. Uh, oh, that, uh, some kind of planetary nebula oh, nearby. Artifact. Yeah. Oh. So it's small and faint planetary nebula. That's what Able it is. One. Okay. Able, she thought Able it was an artifact. They thought it was an artifact, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think C214 is, is the prettier of the two. Um, and that's kind of why I wanted to do it uh, again. So. Hmm. Wow. So, have my, so Dick, have you been to that astrobin.com website? Astro, oh, that's, yes, I have. I've been there a few times. Yes, I've looked, because every once in a while I come up and they're the only place that has something or, you know, the, uh, the, the pictures are just unbelievable. Hmm. It's just unbelievable what they do. So well, it's it's, it's, sounds like you could submit your pictures there. Oh yeah. Well, you know, you never know. You know, it was kind of funny though, is the, the different colors you get from the North American, because I've got the one shot with the NP or, or with the, uh, uh, the red cat, and it's kind of a reddish color, and yet this one came out blue with, you know, some of the dark nebula in there as well. Well, if you look at the wiki on it, the wiki picture is very much like what I did, you know, where you got the blue and then you got the red edge. And it's funny because the guy did it in Pixar site. I, I kind of followed the thread through from the image on Google. And it was on a cloudy nights page where the guy had submitted the image originally. Um, and that one was talking, taken with a Takahashi, I think, uh, that he did there. But it was a single, uh, you know, he didn't do a mosaic like I did. Right there. Of course, so. you're, you're use, aren't you using a uh, Canon 60D or 6, 6A? 6D. It's 6D MK2. Yeah, second, second generation sensor. Well, so well, now. Is there, a, is there a 6A which has the, the IR filter removed? Is that the one that has it removed? Oh, no, you're or? talking about the RA. You're talking about the, uh, well, you know what? I don't know. You may know something I don't know because all I know is it's on modified and it, it has all the cut filters in it, you know, just like a normal camera would. And that's Mike, kind of what I wanted. Does Mike, uh, is that what you have the same thing or do you have the cut filters? I mean, the filters removed i have a i have a first generation 60. yeah well so, unmodified un, unmodified yeah and I, I haven't had a real chance to use it that much because i've got to go and build up a uh a dc power supply for it um using an old battery so that i don't run out of juice i did do you use just regular batteries when you take images with that yeah i use the extended uh when i got mine there was a deal where you could get the extended battery pack. Yeah, so, and it, yeah, and I just use the two batteries. That'll get you through a whole night, uh, usually, I think, without too much trouble. Uh, I'd be real concerned about using an external power supply because there's a reason why they don't have those power supplies built into those cameras because of the noise. So, oh, well, the, the way that I constructed it, uh, I, ma I made one that I used for my my rebel and my 40d where it's a um you, you just take the body and inside it you've got capacitors and inductors and then i've got a 
what is known as a linear regulator in a box through a cable that's like uh, five or six feet away that goes to either a battery or a power supply. So, oh, I see. And so I put lots of filtering in there and I don't see any artifacts. You put enough filtering, you can get away with that. I, mm -hmm. I use what they call single-ended and um, double-ended uh, filtering where it's Oh gosh, I forget the term of it. I haven't used it for about three or four years. Uh, um, we got two windings that go through the, 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 the ferrite at the same time. Uh -huh. it, it provides differential filtering. So you get it both ways. Uh, so yeah, inside the body, I've got like a thousand microfarads in parallel with a couple of uh, small ceramic capacitors. So I cover all the frequencies of noise there. And then I also cover it um, in the power supply itself where I put the additional filtering. And the only thing that I could possibly do to get the noise down even further is to use uh, like a form of coaxial cable that's shielding that would shield it from one to another. But I've never, I, ha I haven't seen any any difference. And it's a, it's a linear regulator. So it's low noise um, mm. it was a there was a switching regulator yeah you'd be concerned but these cameras use low enough power that you can get away with a a, a linear regulator rather than a switching one and still have lots of battery life so mm. i used to have to deal with that for work so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've kind of decided to kind of stay within the visual spectrum and, and not get into some of this stuff. I got all the filters for the narrow band stuff, but and I've tried to play it around with it a little, little bit, but uh, I'm going to stick where I'm at right now. For now, uh, you know, maybe I'll get excited and do something like that. Your exposure times are much uh, shorter as a result. I mean, with those narrow band filters. You know, you're multiplying uh, the time you need to, to get the same amount of photons by several times. That's why she had so much time on there because you're not getting that much. No. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doing pretty good as you are. I mean, from where you're at. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the way I figured it. You know, just kind of keep it going the way that I. And I like to, I like the, I like to see it kind of more or less like it would be, you know, if you could get out in space somewhere and actually look at these objects, what would they look like? You'd want to have it look like the human eye sees it, not like the Hubble palette or something like that. Uh, it's fine if you're trying to do a scientific study, but if you're just trying to see this thing visually for what it is, I'd rather stay in the visual spectrum. Well, you're getting pretty good results with uh, a normal DLSR, you know, from, from those pictures. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. I've, I've been really happy. I mean, shoot, I remember film days, you know, and, it, and I thought, you know, when I started doing this stuff, my expectations were way down here, you know, and, and, and now I like, you know, things are just like, you're like, I, I get blown away when I see this stuff. I go, my gosh, you know, I can't believe it's that good. So, yeah. So, what what yeah. what is the diff difference between using a DSLR and then you know a ZWO camera? So, what what do we what is the difference? You know, on I think the big deal here with these CMOS cameras is they consume a large amount of power, and they have a heat dissipation issue as a result of that. See, we were talking about, when Jerry was talking about the CCD technology, you have a row and you have a column amplifier. And, and that's why the propagation delay is so much greater than it is with the CMOS, because the CMOS, you had amplifiers built into each pixel. Okay, so that's fine, but that means your power consumption goes way up. You know, the speed is good, but with higher speed, and that many amplifiers, the power, the power consumption goes up. So that's why these other devices that have built-in cooling and so forth that 
their CMOS cameras. See, that's why it's a big it's a big deal to do it because of the fact that you get all this thermal noise as a result of the amplifiers. Well, you also have heating from all the other circuitry um, that's not in the ZW. You don't have the um, output electronics to the flat screen. Uh, and in the case of the 6D, you have a Wi-Fi um, a module that's powered up and uh, uh, a bunch of other electronics that GPS, whatever. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, you take that out, all of a sudden you got less power being dissipated. Yeah. And that's another there. thing that you're pointing out there, too, is, is that it's lighter weight. So when you start to put this on an optical assembly and you've got a rack and pinion focusing tube, you can be sure that that the sensor plane is not going to be perpendicular to the optical plane. It just isn't going to be that way. You're going to get some sag and you're going to get sag. I can show you on just about every single instrument that I have. You're going to get some sag no matter whether it's a pitfall or, you know, it's, uh, let's say, just a regular triple, triple acromat. So, you know, you're going to get some of that kind of stuff, uh, unless you've got, let's say, the red cap. That's probably the only one that doesn't have any tube sack, but that's... Well, actually, the SCTs probably would not have it because a lot of times you just screw it in, you know, like at C11, you got something that's yeah. like about three or four inches, you screw it in there. That's, you know... Well, and then the NP one twenty seven IS is two point four yeah. inch focusing tube, so yeah. that's even even buffer. Um, but on some of the other rack and pinion focusers, you, you do get tube sag. So you start to put a heavy weighted camera on there, and you're just increasing your problems with the tube sag. So there's a lot of benefits for these guys that have got these. Uh, uh, what are they called? Those Raza telescopes, the ones, yeah. So, you know, there's another one right there. Would you want to put a big 6D out there or would you want to get one of these little sensors? Thank you. Yeah, same deal. Yeah, on my, uh, on my uh, Migres, I always thought about somehow having a new tube machine for it so that my camera wouldn't have to stick out that, that far because I've got an aftermarket fluorite lens. And so the, the out focus is like about three or four more inches. And with the focuser, it's out like three quarters of the way. So a lot of things are hanging on there. And so if I were to make the tube longer or somehow take the focuser off and put an interme intermediary tube on there because they basically clamp on there with three screws around the outside. It's sort of like a, uh, uh, you call a, a machine lip. You could put that further than, you know, you take up the weight. The other thing is somehow attaching a rod to the Los Manny dovetail that takes up some of the weight. In other words, it carries the weight of the camera and so you can, you know, once you got to focus, you tighten two things and then you don't get any flaw. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I always thought about an, an astrograph where the main mirror gets moved in and out and you rigidly mount the camera on the side uh, for, uh, for maximum, uh, to minimize the flexure, you know, on a, on a round two, just mount it real solidly. Um, so I, I thought about doing that. Um, or you can get a good focuser like the moonlights. That, that's usually what people do. They yeah. seem to be rock solid. Yeah. But then again, if it's offset too much from the tube, then you're straining the tube. So you need to you know, have a lot of area to, to handle that stress, you know. Yeah, yeah, the Red Cat is the only instrument that I don't have any tube sack problems, but that's because it's front focusing lens, so <laughs> you don't have to worry. Well, actually, that old C90 that uh, um, uh, was shown in the beginning, 
that has no no sag that gets attached directly on there, you know, to the old C nineties. So. Uh, so I have to. Uh, I, I want to modify my uh, motors a little bit. I think the G11 because I I did some math. I, I didn't. I don't have it with me right now. But it looks like uh, you know if you if you use a 64 times micro step uh, in a stepper motor, then um, you're getting to the point where one step is actually uh, larger than a pixel or about the same size, uh, or actually it's a, it's a little bit less. And um, I can push it to 256 times with the, you know, with the TMC2130 stepper drivers. But the thing with the stepper motor is that if you take smaller steps, then for every step, you know, if you go from 64 to 128 to 256, then you go, uh, you know, that's a factor of four. But it also, the incremental torque also decreases by a factor of four. So I think, you know, some of the things that I see may be due to the fact that you know, the, the incremental torque is too small because the, these are just fairly small stepper motors. And um, I'm curious, so if, you, if, if I would use a one to four uh, timer belt, timing belt reduction, reduction, then you get smaller steps and you get a higher torque. So it should be a lot better than if I just go, you know, change my stepper motor to 256 steps. So that's I wonder if a planetary uh, gearing system would have, uh would be more accurate from a standpoint of uh, smoothness, smoothness, if you know what I mean. But I'm not sure how you would uh, attach it to your motor. And to well, what I'd have to do, I think I'm going to do it. Uh, the first version is going to be just a, a simple piece of plywood. I think uh, three layers might be enough. I could even fiberglass it to make it stronger. That's easy to work with. Uh, so I need two holes, um, or maybe three holes, to, to attach it to the mount. I have the screws. And then uh, the motor would be below the spot where it is now, which which is actually good because sometimes the telescope hits the motor, and if it would be a little smaller, that would be actually help. And then uh, so that you'd have a, a pulley that goes to the top. There are several people who do this kind of stuff, and I'm not sure if I just want to do it for RA, because that's the most important thing uh, for declination. I'm not quite sure. I, I would probably do it on both sides, but uh, yeah. So I need to find a, a, a suitable. Uh, four to one um, timing belt. I'm not sure if any, any of you have recommendations or something, but uh, I'll, I can just search online. Maybe go to the on-step on -step, uh, board as there. So, yeah, so I, on, a, on a very good night, I can get to half an arc second, but it would have to be, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of rare that I achieve that. Otherwise it's gonna be around one arc second. <clears throat> and that's that's more than it, then what issue you, you is can that your guiding the, accuracy that you measure yeah you, you can see the stars getting blurry at that point and of course with a 12 inch sail it's not not that easy of course that <laughs> that doesn't help so but uh yeah and then you know um i, I bet those stepper motors are not strong enough at that resolution mm -hmm. well with the uh with the miso i get between four tenths to about eight tenths um RMS on uh, with PhD guiding, but part of that is due to the fact that uh, the scene is so bad here. The yeah. location is seen. Right. And that happens here as well. Because I you know certain nights are just a hell of a lot worse than others, and it's not the wind. <laughs> and I'm setting it up the same way. Yeah. So that's just a scene. Yeah. I'm, get, I'm starting to get pretty good. Uh, I've been experimenting with. Astro art because um, I, I purchased that uh, to to reduce the size of the stars. Okay, <laughs> so cool. I feel yeah. like I'm, I'm cheating a little bit, but hey, you know. And yeah. uh, I know AIP for wind and also PixInsight has some some tools to help you with that. Yeah. yeah. Has anybody tried to image? Uh, Jupiter or uh, Saturn lately because they're at opposition. I haven't been able to because of weather conditions, but uh, I, mean, I need to get the C14 on the mount. I don't have a mount. I don't have an observatory. So <laughs> that's still in there out there somewhere in the Earth for real. Do you have a C14? 
I got a C14 sitting on my shop floor. I've had it on the shop floor for freaking over a month now. Okay. And I don't have anything I can put it on. Ah. So, and I, okay. you know, I bought the stuff all in sequence so that it, you know, that, that I could, like the observatory first. And, and I bought that way back in uh, January. And we're still out, you know. I, I decided to stick with them. They, they talked me into staying there. I figured, well, what else, to, what other choice do I have? I'd have to go get something else. And then that would take months and months and months. Mm. So that's what you're getting right now is just that same thing. And then I needed to get some rings. So uh, every place that I tried to get rings from, uh, they uh, weren't taking any orders. Uh, even the soft that bisque thing that I was showing you that there was a real expensive that you were saying Hank that you could buy a telescope for that much money. So I ended up going calling the parallax guys, uh, or actually not calling them, but sending them an email, shooting an email over there, and uh, yeah, I said they'd make them. Uh, and so I got that going. Uh, so uh, if I can get the rings and uh, the mount. Uh, I'll probably have just about everything that I can mount it to the, the pier with, uh, without the uh, uh, observatory. That's the only big problem right now. I, I think I also need rings. I've, I'm using just a dovetail on the bottom of the C11, and then sometimes I can see where it. Uh, yeah, uh, there you go. That's I right. Get elongated uh, stars, even though my tracking says it's perfect. So, uh, yeah, so he's that. got, that's the price list. And so I just, and you'll have, I think he's got standard sizes on here for like your C11 uh, yeah. probably is on here. And plus you got your C14. That's what I got there. He's got standard and he's got rotating rings either way. So, so I got the C14, uh, 15.3 inch OD. And let's see if you have an 11. Yeah, it's uh, about 300. Yeah, there you go. So that's on 12 inch OD. So, Mike, were you referring to differential flexure with your scope? I, I'm beginning to think that it's differential flexure. Yeah, you know, can also solve it by getting an off axis guider, right? Uh, that's yes, better. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm looking into that. Um, yeah, th that's a good point because uh, I've heard a lot of people having flexure problems with the, with the schmidt cassic range, especially. So, uh, and, and that's why, I, another reason why I went there with the C14, because I figured at that focal length, you, you could have all kinds of problems. Yeah, the only thing that I, another thing I have a problem with the, the C11, it's got really nice optics, but it's the older type. It's... Um, doesn't have a mirror lock. And so oh. I could be suffering from that too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, you know, I don't know about the mirror lock though. I mean, I don't know about Schmidt cast screen, but I don't even use it on my 10 inch. Uh, I, I usually leave the locks off. So I, you know, I, I never really seem to have it. It'll shift around a little bit, but be darn if I'm going to re culminate during a shoot because if you do that, you're going to lose your position. That's so, where the off-axis guider would come in uh, handy to compensate for it. The, the, I've I've been pretty pretty lucky with it, um, although again there are times that it just seems like uh, you know I, I get these elongated stars, and you know when and and when PhD says oh well you're you're accurate to a fraction of an arc second and you can see you know. Oh, uh, you know, um, good and plenty stars, you know, uh, then you, you got to know that it's differential flexure. And, and could be also, it could be also with the fact that I've got such a long distance on my guide camera too. You know, I've got, oh, about eight inches, 10 inches off the, uh, the focuser, um, even though I try and use a two inch you know, I use two inch extension tubes, you know, you still have that flexure problem, like you say. And, uh, so maybe yeah. part of the part of the equation is trying to make a ring or something like that that goes around the focuser. Once I get it focused, I clamp it, 
and that gets tied to the dovetail where it's very it becomes more rigid. And I've I've got I've got the nice um, um, clamshell rings where I could put a piece of metal that comes right off of it, so I could you know go above and below with a piece of metal and put a clamp on there to clamp both sides to keep it rigid. And I just haven't gotten around to that yet because I have yeah. other technical problems. Yeah, I, I think when I said off-axis guider, I guess it works for me because my scope is F4. But if you have a C11 and it's uh, like, you know, yeah, yeah. And you're going to get very faint stars and it's going to be yeah. hard to find something. So that's what I was wondering. If, just you use a focal if you use a focal reducer, it might be okay. Why not just get a guide scope? For well, me? Yeah. I do. It's called a uh, Amigras yeah. 80. Um, it's an F7. And, but the, the, because it's an F7, it was built for an F, F6 lens originally. Um, I have to put extension tubes on the back of it. And even though I've got the, uh, um, the uh, ZWO, which is no larger than this here, you know, it's about the same size as, as a star sheet. You know, it, there's still, it's, it's still a moment arm that, you know, metal Oh, so in other words, you still have the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. So Gosh, you know, I, yeah. And then what, so what's the focal length of that scope, that guide scope? It's five, uh, 590 or something like 500? that. 500? Wow, that's, yeah, that's more than enough. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, because I'm planning on using the NP127 IS for a, a guide scope for the C14. That's the standard configuration. And then I've just got that. I think I got showed it to you. It's it's uh, it's a little um, table that you can move it up and down, a little alt aspect table. That'll sit on top of the C14. So do you want to just do planetary work and, and uh, making images, taking images, or also DSOs? Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, I think both deep sky and and planetary is kind of where I want to head into that direction. And I mm -hmm. thought I would probably start with the moon, mm -hmm. you know, first just to learn how to shoot that way because I, I don't have any experience. That's a totally different technique, right? I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't need a guide scope for that because you, no, you not for that stuff, stuff. not for that. You take, you take images very fast. It's going to be like oh. a, like a webcam type of thing, or yeah, you know, yeah. No, I I didn't plan it for that, but but for uh, the deep sky, yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. Be forewarned. Um, so I, I would recommend getting a five terabyte external hard drive once you start getting into planetary imaging. Because I spent about three, uh, two hours yesterday going through my file system on my two gigabyte drive, offloading images that oh, can I get rid of this? You know, is this junk? So just so that I can get extra. I mean, yeah, you know, it, it just. Uh, from the last opposition, I probably have like half a terabyte of images that I, oh, I just don't want to get rid of because maybe I'll be able to, you know, extract a little bit more out of it once I get better at it, and, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, for that, I, I have a network accessible storage. And like last year, I think I was telling you guys that uh, I went through 1.6 terabytes. And I got two terabytes on this system here that I'm using right here. So I had to switch all that stuff and put it over there on the NAS. And uh, that, that works out pretty well. It's a, it's a 10 terabyte RAID 1, you know, two, two mirror drive type configuration. And it oh. works really well. Yeah, be sure to yeah. make a backup of that. Yeah, uh, well, it's, it's RAID 1. So at least you got two drives, one mirror to the other. So if one drive goes down, then you got okay, the other. Okay, so one. they're not interleaved because it's no, interleaved. No, 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 it's not one of those deals right there. They're mirror. In that yeah. configuration, they're mirror. If you go to something like grade two, then you start interleaving the drives. Yeah. 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 So that, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm looking for a, a new camera, you know, uh, Uber camera. And I don't really want to get, I don't want to get more pixels. 
okay, I want to get more efficient pixels and I want to get larger pixels because they have a higher full well capacity. You know, uh, they're like ZWO is selling us with 34 megabyte pixel camera. And um, part of the problem is that the pixels are so small that even though it's a very sensitive camera, your full well capacity is so low that you have to dither, otherwise you start getting this noise effect. And it's 34 megabytes per image. So in order to get rid of this noise, you need to take many pictures and all of a sudden, you know, gigabytes per night, you know. And so But but this, is this for planetary? Because for, for planetary no, you no, don't no, no. You no, don't need for, a, a lot of resolution for planetary, and for DSOs, well, for DSOs, you just throw all the subs away yeah, after I, you're done stacking, right? I mean, I, I I always do that. I never I keep them. I think the twenty six hundred uh, ZWO twenty six hundred has the full frame, uh, or is it uh, APS-C? But it's thirty four megapixels. But the pixels yeah. are only like two microns or something like that, and so yeah, they're um, three and a half microns because I have the camera, so. Uh, I've got yeah. the mono and the and the color, and no, no, it's it, APS-C size, not not full frame size. Okay, there's there's a one that's even bigger that's full frame that's yes. got more megapixels. Yep. Yeah. So how's got, is it? The, the, the sixty two hundred, I think. Yeah. I got gold. At nine right. o'clock, should we call it? Uh, anything else you want to discuss before we call it? Yeah. Okay, it's been a pleasure again, guys. Um, Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. It did keep up the good work. I really like those pictures. Oh, oh thank you so much for that. Thank you yeah. so much. I yeah, welcome. It. Yeah. All right, you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Hank, for Stellophane. We'll see yeah, you again. Thank mate. you for that. That was wonderful. Okay. All right. Good night, all. Night.